Atheist Nomads episode 429, The Scrambling of Africa. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin and joining me is Lauren. Hello. At least for a little while. Yeah, we'll see. (laughs) I'm tired. Per usual. And... I am really sorry about the sale. Um, I'd gotten bad information that I included in the episode, and then I was going to remove it, and then I forgot. Oh, no. Okay, yeah, we figured out later that night or the next day. Between recording and editing, that the dollar amount I had been told the sale was for was off by a dollar. That's right, because I went to go get one for my dad and found that the sale was ending three days earlier. And that actually wasn't actually, it wasn't oh, actually it ending. It the sale every yeah. day for like three days or something. But um, yeah, okay. But either way. So yeah, so because that didn't quite work out all according to plan, um, we've got a second sale uh, coming up next week, starting on the 27th. So before the episode goes live. Okay. So between the 27th and 31st of October, $14 shirts and up to 35% off everything else. Okay. Cool. That's the sale at atheistnomads.com slash store, October 27 through 31. It's a Halloween sale. (laughs) All right. So now for dust enough degree we're continuing the series on africa and the scrambling of africa obviously is a play on words yeah he had to explain this one to me because i'd never heard the term scrambling for africa and but apparently that was in reference to the scramble for africa right the scramble for africa and so since last week we did a broad overview of the history of religion in africa This week, we need to do a less broad, but still brutally broad overview of why so much of Africa is so impoverished and unstable. Brutally broad. I like that. That would be my roller derby name. (laughs) Uh, Because again, when you're talking about Africa, it's the second largest continent. There's nearly a billion people or around a billion people who live on the continent of Africa. There are more spoken languages on the continent of Africa than the rest of Earth. There is more genetic diversity within the continent of Africa than there is the entire rest of the Earth. Broad brush strokes don't make sense in a place that diverse. Right. It's so easy for... Eurocentric or Western centric mentalities to think, oh yeah, it's just a it's just a big old island full of black people. Which is why when in the eighteen hundreds a group of white people who thought that black people were subhuman carved up the continent with broad brush strokes. And it is easy to look at the borders of Africa up against a ethnolinguistic map of Africa and see that none of the borders make any sense. Except that's wrong. The borders actually do make sense if you're looking at it from the perspective of the people who drew them. They knew they were mixing ethno-linguistic groups. That was intentional. It was a feature, not a bug. Right. Europeans creating colonies in Africa were not trying to create stable societies. They were trying to keep them unstable. Right, they were trying to keep them under the heel of their boots. Yeah, keep them unstable so they could be controlled. The general concept was have a majority group and a minority group within the native populations in a given territory, and then have an even smaller minority of Europeans present. The Europeans are the bosses, then the native minority group are the underbosses, And then the majority group are at the bottom. Right. And by keeping that structure, you've got local, a large enough local population who it's in their interest to keep the Europeans in power that you can't get that big of a uprising. That was the concept. Um, That was the idea. It's how they did Africa. It's how they did. That's how Britain especially did. That's how they did North America, South America. Uh, Britain. Oh, 
<laughs> North and South America, um, they didn't worry about the native inhabitants that much. They just wiped them out as much as they could. Between disease and warfare, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, f- they found a different way of doing things. South, okay, South America and Central America, the, the native population stayed more stable, but um, sticking with Africa, uh, Britain and France set up large, horribly racist and exploitative colonies. Germany also set up horribly racist and exploitative colonies. Um, Portugal had colonies that were slightly less racist, but pretty seriously exploitative. Well, they all did. I mean, you don't have to... There's, yeah. there's one standout. Oh. Belgium. Belgian Congo was King Leopold's personal territory because why the hell not most of the colonies were run in such a way that the average local inhabitant was not quite a slave but relatively close belgian congo the entire country were the slaves of leopold wow it was the most brutal the most horrible and horrifying because it was his personal playground to extract as much money as he could out of it. Now, one thing that, if it had not been for the colonization of Latin America, wouldn't have been able to colonize Africa. What they needed to be able to do that was to get quinine for protection against malaria. Oh, yes, the infamous gin drink. Gin and tonic. If you drank enough gin and tonic, you could survive in Africa if you're white. Prior to that, white people who tried to go down into Africa, central Africa did not survive. The only real exception were the Boers in South Africa. Um, Dutch settlers. How did they manage? They were far enough south that malaria wasn't as big of a concern. Uh, okay. They ducked south of it and didn't go through any of the central tropical. Yeah. They would have had malaria concerns on par with the southern U.S., not malaria concerns on par with Central America. Okay. For the time period. Uh, so with the, these, uh, these intentionally unstable borders, uh, the ruling structure was very much set up such that all of the management, all of the control, and all of the property were held by a very small number of white people. Uh, there were, for, for example, in the Rhodesian colonies, uh, modern day Zambia and Zimbabwe. Okay. There were laws that prohibited black people from buying land and quickly redistributed land to white people. Right. Hey, you want some free land in this, you know, in this area? Sure. Come on down. We'll give it to you. Let's take it away from these people first. There was also plenty of areas where the concept of personal ownership of land wasn't a thing until Europeans showed up and decided they owned the land. I roll. Uh... So then when decolonization started, this was post-World War II, uh, global global sensibilities had turned against colonization and were turning against that systemic of racism. Uh, Yeah, right. (laughs) I mean, there's the obvious racism and then there's the not so obvious racism that will allow to fester for another, you know, couple generations. But let's get rid of the really super soul crushingly obvious stuff and so and then there was also uh marxist ideology uh and the the soviet union and and communist china being anti-imperial while running massive empires themselves uh so there was a lot of pressures to end the particular style of distant colonies and break up the the empires and so finally in the, the 1960s and 70s, African countries were decolonized. Um, Britain ended up having a mixed record on it. Um, their policy was you had to have a majority rule democratic government needed to be in place for Britain to withdraw. In Zambia, that worked. Zambia, which at that time was northern Rhodesia, uh, they held elections. And the it stuck. <laughs> a black man won the election to become president. Formed a government. There were white people involved in the government. It was a mixed coalition, and Britain left. And they have been a relatively stable country ever since. Okay. 
relatively stable. Uh, Best you could hope for. To the south of them, what was at the time called South Rhodesia, uh, the white people in control did not want to have majority rule because they would lose power. So they preempted uh, the whole process with a unilateral declaration of independence, citing the United States Declaration of Independence as Uh, precedent. So instead of letting Great Britain leave with certain rules in place, they're Mm -hmm. like, screw you, we're out. Yeah. We're going to do it our own way. Get out now. So 1964, they set up an apartheid government, which in all practicality, they continued the apartheid system that Britain had already put in place and then strengthened it to better align with what they were doing in uh, South Africa. Okay. Uh, Just as a quick note, I didn't learn what apartheid was until college. (laughs) College. And if you don't know what apartheid is, uh, apartheid and segregation are the same thing. We in South Africa we call it apartheid. In the United States we call it segregation. It's laws that restrict. It, it's it's laws that prohibit interracial marriage. It's laws that restrict what races can live where, and they're designed and how to, they can live and how they can live, and to restrict the voting rights of a particular ethnic group um in the american south it was a white majority in the late 1800s in a couple of states um it was actually a white minority holding on to power uh through blue laws and in south africa it was the apartheid system um it was to keep people apart yeah keep people separate oh i never got that apartheid yeah apart Uh, Uh, apart and subjugated yes uh that doesn't really rule off the tongue as well as apartheid, though. No, no. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what Rhodesia basically did. Um, they had guerrilla warfare and against the, the white government. And the guerrillas were backed by China and Russia. Uh, the white government eventually, after having sanctions against it by the entire world, uh, conceded, allowed Britain to take back over return to colonial status and allow big old step backwards multiracial democratic elections to happen and forwards yeah uh now one of the things that i've i've hinted at and and when talking about colonialism and post-colonial periods and post-colonial instability and The history of racism, it's hard to say things that don't sound kind of racist. I want to make sure it is very clear. The situation that sub-Saharan African countries are in is because of racist Europeans. Those countries are unstable because of racist Europeans intentionally destabilizing them. Right. And setting them up to not be possible as stable countries. Right. You can't just, you know, wa- you know, wander in, call them shithole countries because of the people that live there. No, 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 no. That's not how that works. No. Assholes turn them into shitholes. Yeah. Very intentionally. Yeah. Uh, but we need to understand the how this happened for the next couple topics about how particular forms of pentecostal christianity are taking oh yeah hold. we're getting into the religious stuff and that's always fun but we need to understand how it got there for that to make sense as to how it's taking hold uh so each of these countries as they became independent and got majority rule followed very similar paths because the european colonizers did not allow local native people to get quality education, to develop skills and expertise. You can't learn to run a business or govern yeah. people. So, and of course, any ways you may have had to do that are gone. Right. So you end up getting cases like Zimbabwe, formerly Southern Rhodesia. Once there was black majority rule, they didn't seize all the land from the white people right away. Um, but you end up having an incredibly... Uh, corrupt government run by a dictator who held on to power for 30 years. Mm. And eventually he did seize land from white people and property from white people. And at face value and in a, the sense of justice, it makes absolute sense to undo the 
land and wealth redistribution that happened during the colonial period to take that from the white minority and give it back to the black majority. In almost every case where they've done that, the end result has ended up being their economy crumbles. Mm. And it's because of... Damned if you do, damned if you don't. When all of the money and power is consolidated in a few, nobody else learns how to handle it. Mm. It's a feature of the system, not a bug. It was designed that way. It was designed that way. Yeah. They were not designed... The colonies were not set up to be able to have stable political systems rise up. They were set up to stay subjugated and to not have the the knowledge and ability to run their own countries. And now several generations in, a lot of countries in Africa are still really struggling at getting on their feet because they don't have that tradition of, well, they still don't have the infrastructure because many countries in Africa have had many years of dictatorships And most of them have had, almost all of them have had many years of dictators. And dictators follow in the same footsteps of colonial overlords of don't let anybody else learn how to run things. Yeah. Keep that all consolidated in the few. Kind of short-sighted, but there you go. Keep the people stupid and unable to rise up. Yeah. So that you can stay in power. Uh, A lot of the... In the early, early days of independence in Africa, uh, they were the third world. Not the entirety of the third world, but much of the third world. And the third world does not mean the developing world. Right. Using first world, second world, third world is kind of... It is... Uh, it doesn't make sense anymore. Kind of Cold War-ish. It is Cold War it is terminology. Cold War terminology, so it doesn't really flow anymore. The first world was the United States and its close allies. NATO, Japan... South Korea. The second world was the Warsaw Pact and China. So Soviet Union, China, Eastern Europe. The third world were the unaligned countries that the two were vying for influence in. Not the... Rich natural resources, lots of people vying for control over them. And None of them allowed to really develop past basic infrastructure. And when the U.S. and Soviet Union are vying for control or influence, it's CIA operatives supporting rebel groups and the Soviets backing rebel groups. And now U.S. Special Forces bases in almost every country. Yeah. Uh, It it hasn't stopped. (laughs) Uh, Beyond just the... Uh, dictatorships, uh, military coups, cold wars, or civil wars, um, those have all been incredibly destabilizing. And even if your particular country doesn't have a civil war in it, a civil war in the ne- your next door neighbor destabilizes your country. <laughs> a prime example is the Great African Wars, which most Americans don't know happened. Uh, The story there is the Rwandan genocide uh, with the Hutus and Tutsis destabilized what was then called Zaire. Um, That was by, after the genocide, rebel groups fled the border into Zaire to escape Rwandan military forces. Which I think most adults have probably had an inkling of, most millennial adults probably have heard of the Rwandan genocide. The Rwandan genocide, yes. Hotel Rwanda. There was a movie not too a movie about 15 it. years ago about it. Most of us know it happened. Um, we don't know that that prompted 10 years of warfare. Oh, yeah. In the surrounding countries. Denzel Washington doesn't go into that. No. Uh, because the Rwandan, after the genocide, uh, yeah, rebel groups went into Zimbabwe and the Zairean government sent forces to try to kick them out. And then other countries sent in their forces and rebel groups got involved and it turned into a civil war with countries from as far away as Algeria and South Africa sending forces in to help one side or the other. Yeah, it sounds like Idaho sending forces down to the Mexican border. <laughs> like what, what business do you even have doing that? Except we don't actually have a war going on at the Mexican no. border. <laughs> And so then the government changed hands a couple times. Uh, There was a brief period of peace. And officially, the the Second Congo War ended almost 15 years ago. But we still have Boko Haram and the Lord's Army, a Muslim and Christian fundamentalist rebel group fighting in what's now known as 
the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Yeah, it's pretty bad. It hasn't stopped. Mm, it's changed names a couple of times, but... It's hard to build a stable society when you've got warfare. But one of the big factors is to have a stable society, you need infrastructure. And it's hard to pave roads when you've got Boko Haram picking off construction crews. Or just straight up blowing up the roads. <laughs> Uh, then there's diseases. Malaria is estimated to suppress 33% of the GDP across all of sub-Saharan Africa. 33%. Yeah. That national productivity is down by a third. That means any chance to build is stopped automatically. Uh, when you pair that with the impact that corrupt governments and dictatorships and civil wars have on economic progress and development. You get cases like Zimbabwe, where the economy has basically collapsed. It's gone from being one of the strongest in Africa to basically non-functional. Yeah. Mm. This is all really depressing. It is. It is. Uh, and we haven't even gotten to HIV yet. Oh, yay. Which HIV probably wouldn't have happened if not for King Leopold's personal property in the middle of Africa. Ah, yes, of course. He set up mines deep into the heart of Africa and a network of cities along the river to get the ore out to where it could make him money. Yeah. Those cities set up the kinds of frontier city businesses that you end up getting to support miners that are traveling through, much like we had in the western U.S. and the the Wild West brothels days. and casinos and brothels. saloons. Um, it's estimated that in the 1920s, 45% uh, of all women in what was then called Leopoldville oh God. were prostitutes. Yeah. And it's estimated that around that same time period, about a quarter to a half of the country's population had syphilis. That is important because that opened up a particular mutation in simian immunodeficiency virus to cross through bushmeat harvest into humans sometime around 1920 and then travel through the brothels. Ah, uh, see, I learned it, not officially, but I learned in high school that a gay man had sex with a chimp. No. That's, no. Okay. No. I didn't think that that's probably what it was, but... um. <laughs> I, we were never told, taught any of this stuff, of course, but I do remember the rumors going around. Like, yeah, a gay, gay guy had sex with a chimp in Africa and started HIV. Like, no. What, what's, what's crazy is it's taken epidemiological, historical, forensic work to work this back. Like, the, the main North American sus uh, patient zero for HIV was a gay flight attendant who got it from a Haitian. The Haitians got it from providing medical relief in Zaire, what Belgian Congo <laughs> was, right. what had previously been Belgian Congo. And the doctors had picked it up at brothels in the Belgian Congo or, or Zaire, whichever it was called at that point. And it had been traveling for so long and it wasn't identified even to be a thing until the mid 1980s. That is mind-boggling. Yeah, yeah, the epidemiologists kind of dropped the ball on that one. But that's what happens when diseases rampage through poorer communities mm -hmm. and don't hit white people as hard. Yep. Yep. The fact that there's even a malaria vaccine now <laughs> is, like, freaking amazing. Absolutely. Like enough white people got it that they finally decided to do something about it. Sweet. Uh, HIV, of course, has spread, continued to spread. And is now has the highest rates in southern Africa, um, much higher than, than where it started, uh, with the hardest hit country currently being Eswatini at 26%. Uh, if you don't recognize the name Eswatini, it used to be called Swaziland. Oh. They have asked the world to call them by a different name. <laughs> okay, e Eswatini? Eswatini. Okay. Yes. Uh, but 26% of the population between the ages of, of 15 and 49, have HIV. Wow. Uh, in the surrounding countries in Southern Africa, the numbers are pretty similar. Uh, across all of Sub-Saharan Africa, 
the HIV rate is 4.9%. That is compared to the global average of 0.8%. HIV has seriously added to continued destabilization of Africa. Right. Um, you put all this together and you've got a billion people who haven't had a lot of, where very few have had good opportunities and where a lot of people are desperate. You could have summed that all up with this entire continent of people who are poor, sick, and desperate. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Africa in a nutshell. Uh, now, Thanks to white people. To be greedy, white people. Now, to try to be, to be fair, there are examples of stable, thriving, happy centers of humanity within sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. Um, that's not where most of the people live. Well, yeah. <laughs> And we will uh, we will continue this next week. All right. In news, Eric Bataxis is a right wing radio host. We've covered several times. Uh, he is host of the Flashpoint program on Kenneth Copeland's The Victory Channel. So right wing Christian propaganda station uh with a really boring awful name <laughs> and he called if it is even possible that this election was stolen i believe it was stolen but let's say it wasn't i want to know i want to be convinced and i want every american to be convinced that our election processes are absolutely transparent and when people tell you to shut up move along that is a big red flag they're hiding something and we all know that the foot dragging that's gone on in Arizona and in other places, that is just absolutely circumstantial evidence. Somebody's hiding something. They don't want us to know what happened. This is a, a satanic uh, usurpation of, of we the people. So to sum that up, he's willing to concede at some point that Joe Biden actually won the election. But he's not willing to do so until he's been thoroughly convinced and that every single American has been convinced that the election was not stolen because it was a satanic usurp usurpation of we the people. That is insane. Has anybody checked with the temple? <laughs> pretty, pretty sure it wasn't them. <laughs> oh, man. Like, dude, crazy is as crazy does. What? How do you even argue? You don't. And... and how do you, how do you convince, like, he's even saying that the, the recounts in Arizona and Pennsylvania are evidence that the election was stolen. The recounts that found that, no, Joe that Trump Biden. Trump definitely, or that Biden. That Biden won. won. That was. Yeah. They've even done recounts here in Idaho with claims that. Determined that Trump definitely won. Yep. Here. Uh-huh. Didn't matter. Didn't change a thing. No, you don't double check the states that clearly were are Republican leaning anyway. <laughs> but the people who've decided the election was stolen, who believed Trump when he said before the election that if he lost, that meant the election was stolen because he couldn't possibly lose. The people who still believe that, I don't know what can be done. Nothing. If you believe in an invisible pink unicorn, then then you're going to keep believing that there is nothing you can do to drive out the crazy maybe like uh what do you call that uh when you do use a medication that a placebo a placebo exorcism <laughs> on the entire country <laughs> and see how many people take it what this demonstrates is the the claims of the united states is a stable bastion of democracy have only been as true as people holding themselves to the democratic tradition of the United States, as imperfect as it is, but yeah. holding to the tradition. Yeah. And all it took was one person breaking from that, and he took 20% of the population with them. That's insane. That's the definition. <laughs> like, bingo. Prophetess Kat Kerr, uh, who's a, a friend of, of Pat Robertson, of course, <laughs> who, who is retiring, finally. Uh-huh, sure. Uh, she has gone out and said that she's got a million angel army that she has command over. Oh, that's so delusional. What? That she will use to stop critical race theory from being taught in schools. Oh, my God. Get over it. Jesus Christ. 
I mean, oh God, I'm so fucking sick of this. Idaho is just rife with this kind of crap. There are real problems in the in the freaking world, and this is what you're going to send a million angel army over? Really? Have you not noticed the pandemic? The people out of work, or people even got, people homeless? Or no. Even bothered to see what critical race theory even is? They have no idea what it is. They have no idea what the concept even is to be able to battle it with angels. It's advanced collegiate level or graduate level philosophical frameworks for looking at legal history. Well, now they're now they're trying to introduce it into high schools. And that's what's freaking people out. Except they're not. Eh. Because critical race theory doesn't apply to that. That's just called teaching history. Yep. <gasps> and he wins the <laughs> he wins the belt, people. It's just teaching history as it actually well, as far as we know, happened. A little closer to what actually happened. And not the crap that was written in the 50s to make white people look good. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't need to know what apartheid actually is. God damn it. Yeah. Teaching the history of segregation in high school, U.S. history class. They've been teaching that for years anyway. What? You need to learn it. They've just been glossing <laughs> it over. And now that people aren't glossing it over, all of a sudden it's... Ugh. And then somebody came across the term critical race theory and was like, oh, yep, that's what it is. That's the boogeyman we can go after. Look at so. McGeechin. <laughs> I'm so sick of our lieutenant governor and her stupid <laughs> McGeechin face. Uh, well, at least McGeechin doesn't have a million angel army. She probably thinks she does. <sighs> oh, man. Okay. You know that she's had phone calls with this woman. <laughs> the The... The write-up in, in Friendly Atheist uh, from uh, Beth Stoneburner has a, a pretty awesome uh, line in it, which I'll read. Quote, A quick Bible lesson. Angels are said to take orders from God, not human beings. When Jacob in the Old Testament tried to command angels, his hip was torn from its socket. Why would Cat Kerr have better luck? Well, the when she <laughs> goes down with a hip injury, we'll know. <laughs> and you know once the hip goes... It's just downhill from there. <laughs> All right. So last week we had a U.S. district judge in New York siding with the crazy people who think there's a religious reason to object to just the COVID vaccine. Okay. Uh, in Maine, a U.S. district judge has dismissed a lawsuit from Christian healthcare workers claiming that being skipping. required to get COVID vaccines to continue to work in healthcare violated their religious freedom. Does that mean that this goes to the Supreme Court? Not yet. But it's getting there? Uh, Maine and New York, I believe, are in the same circuit court, so that will get decided at that level. Oh, okay. Um, this will eventually go to the Supreme Court, I'm sure. Who will bung it up because that's what they've been doing. So the I hope it doesn't. The the judge focused on what was the what is the law that is being used to justify this mandate? And is there any evidence that there was any religious motivation in the creation of the law? Because that's what matters. And what he found is Maine has required healthcare workers to be vaccinated against various diseases for decades. They changed the law in 2001 to allow exemptions for medical, religious, and philosophical reasons. And in 2019, they got rid of religious and philosophical exemptions. That then went to a referendum in March of 2020, and 72% of voters approved that change. Oh, okay. So he stood by that change. So the judge looked at this and the decision to not allow religious and philosophical exemptions to mandated vaccines was made prior to the COVID vaccine being developed. And in fact, before the pandemic even began, that was a rule that had nothing to do with COVID. It had nothing to do with the religious beliefs of healthcare workers. It had to do with how many people were getting bullshit exemptions. Yeah, and putting the public health at risk. And Yeah, putting public health at risk. Now, he could have just simply dismissed it at that. 
But the judge actually went and addressed every single legal claim the plaintiffs made. Well, that was thorough. 41 pages. Oh my God. And wow, he went through dedicated. and dismantled every single <laughs> objection they had. Wow. Nice. Including... Of course, knowing lawyers speak, 41 pages, probably three whole objections, but, you know, whatever. But it included that the state is not requiring that people get the COVID vaccine, but the state doesn't have to, but you don't have a inherent right to work in healthcare either. Right. Well, I mean, those of us on the sidelines are like, why the hell are you a nurse anyway? Ah. <laughs> uh. It's like, you need, to, you need to go back to college, <laughs> go into business or economics or something, because this is not what you're meant for if you don't want to do it. Yeah. They got settled with the student loans, and hell, if they're going to go back and <laughs> do it again. Uh, the Guardian has a really good write-up on the uh, how health and wellness merged with the far right, COVID, COVID denialism anti-mask and anti-vax. And at the core of it is the story of Melissa Rain Lively. Uh, on the 4th of July, 2020, she got on video uh, a altercation she got into over masks at Target, where she said, why? I can't do it. And that is uh, tearing face masks off the racks and just throwing them on the ground. In the store. Okay. So they throw out of the store. She's like, I why? remember this. I can't do it because I'm a blonde white woman wearing a fucking $40,000 Rolex. I don't have the right to, fu uh, to fuck shit up, end quote. Yeah, no. Within a couple weeks of that, her husband left her. She went to the hospital and spent several weeks as an inpatient at a, psych a psychiatric facility and has spent the next 18 months rebuilding her relationships getting back together with her husband, getting back with her children, and undoing a lot of the broken thought processes that she had accumulated. Where those came from was wellness. And the pathway is wellness blogs and wellness sites often are already pushing a... a, a wellness and, and uh, yoga, in particular, are already pushing um, often a anti-healthcare establishment message, anti-big yeah. pharma, anti-big business, and it's pretty easy to throw in an extra anti. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. And they've been, especially when the algorithm on social media sites, the more outrage you can produce, the more you get rewarded. Yeah. So that has encouraged them to add on more and more and more Anties, uh, to the point where a large number of wellness blogs are now just right-wing propaganda sites. <laughs> They're just the suburban woman's housewife version of it. Yeah. And it's, it's the yeah, anti-government establishment, or anti-medical establishment, anti-government establishment. And then, of course, you know, those masks, that's just people trying to force stuff on us and start getting into the conspiracies. And yeah. if you've already started on conspiracies in So this is the wellness, woman who spent like the next like several months apologizing for yeah. the public tirade and was like super embarrassed about it. Basically, she hit a breaking point and she... That was her breaking point. And she, you know, had a legitimate mental breakdown. And unfortunately, the subject of her mental breakdown was then, you know, picked up and carried on by a bunch of other people which she has been trying to undo but i remember mm -hmm. hearing about that like six months later and going oh well I, you know credit to where credit is due she recognized that something was wrong yeah got help and was trying to get things better and is now continuing to try now to, we just need the rest of the country to do that and she's trying to help educate the world on how wellness is fueling crazy yeah because it <laughs> We were talking about this the other day on YouTube. It doesn't take long for whatever interest you have, you know, a couple clicks and all of a sudden you're into extreme stuff. Yeah. The the most extreme version of what you were looking at. And it's like, no. Camping just... camping in, in five videos can turn into van life and history in 10 videos can turn into racism and astronomy in 10 clicks can get you to flat earth. Yeah. It doesn't take long. Because that's the stuff that the algorithm is pushing. 
because it gets the most clicks, Mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. And it's the not clicks are of equal weight, if not weighted more than the pro (laughs) clicks. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I empathize with that. Now, I have to say, a part of me is not surprised. I think it's funny that you think van life is so extreme as to put it on the same level as flat earth, but. uh, It's extreme camping. Uh, (laughs) Okay, the first time the YouTube algorithm. (laughs) The first time. uh, Van life. It's homelessness. The first time YouTube's algorithm took me weird places camping, it was getting into prepper stuff. Oh, the and that got started getting kind of scary. And then the second time it got me into van life stuff, and it, it's it's funny how it works. Yeah. Um, but but none of this should be surprising when you consider the concept of wellness was a coinage and creation of John Harvey Kellogg. Oh God, here we go again. Whose life work was convincing the rich and famous to let him pour acid on their genitals. Yeah. That's the guy who came up with the idea of wellness. And take perfectly healthy people, convince them that they can be more healthy, Mm -hmm. and voila, you've got a big money-making machine. And if you can keep wellness right on the edge of actual medicine, then... Almost seems legit. It seems legit, and you can maximize your money-making. And it has now just completely gone off the deep end. And is doing just fine on the money-making side. Buying stocks and turmeric. (laughs) Anyway, it's a good read, and you can find the links in the show notes. The Reformed Church in America, which has been around since New Amsterdam. Ooh, history lesson there. Yeah, Reformed, so Protestant Dutch colonists settling in New Amsterdam, uh, which I actually had an ancestor who had uh, immigrated to New Amsterdam. She was a French Huguenot, um, French Protestant. Uh, So the Reformed Church being. The movement started by John Calvin, uh, which was a hard determinist, God chooses who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Um, and you there's can, nothing you can do about it. You can do nothing about it. Even having faith cannot save you. It's just, does God choose you to, to be saved? Uh, of course, that was the extreme version of Reformed Christianity back in the 1600s. The modern form um, has actually been diverging in recent years as to whether it's mainstream Protestant or pretty mainstream evangelical Protestant. Uh, The particular current dividing point has been over same-sex marriage and the ordination of gay ministers. Oh, I thought it was going to be lady bits. (laughs) Gotta gotta hate those ordained lady bits. (laughs) And so... They held a general synod in 2016 to address the issue once and for all. And the, the synod passed the, uh, an amendment to the Book of Church Order to define marriage as between a man and a woman. But it needed a two-thirds approval of classes to pass. And the classes okay. are... The regional governance bodies. Everybody's got to have their own names for stuff. Yeah. Um, so the regional, the regions didn't approve. It needed two thirds ratification from the various regions, and they didn't get that. So, so it was all written up, but it wasn't approved. So it failed. Okay. So then they had the 2018 General Synod to address this, and they discovered they couldn't resolve it. So they established Vision 2020. Oh, God. To come up, with a, come up with a plan to... Synergize? Not have a schism. <laughs> I'm sorry, it just sounds like some <laughs> terrible business conference. <laughs> a way to not have a schism and let those who want to have gay pastors and gay marriage have that and those who don't to not have it. When, of course, the easiest solution on that is if you don't want to marry... If you're not gay and don't want to marry a person of the same sex then don't. There you go. And if you don't want a gay pastor, go to a different church. Well, that's the option that a lot of people are getting hung up on. That's the easy option. They don't want to have to go to a different church. Right. So instead, they have decided to completely restructure the organization. Okay. That's easier. Sure. Yep. 
No, uh, nod, wink, wink. Now, of course, Vision 2020 had to be delayed because of the pandemic. You're right. yeah. So they Ooh. finally just held it in what you know, a year. late 2021. Fair amount of virtual elements to it. And the the plan that will still need final formal ratification at a general synod. Uh, now, of course, the, the, the delegates did approve this by a vote of 198 to 9. <laughs> oh, God. So they are going to restructure the classes from being regional to being split over whether or not they affirm gay people or not. They're going to restructure the entire The entire church? church. Based on whether they're pro or anti-gay. Yep. So you'll have a pro-gay church, uh, uh, Reformed Church of America, and a anti-gay Reformed Church of America in the same town under different class leaders, even though they're in the same town. Well, what if they don't have a gay one? Then they only have the non-gay one. What and if, they if they only they, have a gay one? Then they only have that one. Okay. Uh, they are also going to be allowing churches that have decided to leave the denomination to take their building with them and take any money the congregation has. And they'll also have to take any debt that they have. Right. Uh, so just take it and run. But this is like... They're creating a segregated church at a very high, high level. Like, the Adventist church is a... This is really dumb. Yeah. Like, the Adventist church is a segregated church. There's the black regions and the white conferences in the eastern United States, where you have black churches under one set of conference leadership and white churches under a different set of conference leadership. But the Union Conference, the regional kind of overarching, like, geographical regional government they're all under the same union leadership right that's still messed up that's still messed up this is yes. there's going to be a entire half of the church that is pro-gay and an entire half it of the church that is like anti-gay that, it sounds like a quarter of the church is going to be anti-gay and like three quarters of the church is going to be pro-gay uh, it's it's probably going to be closer to 50 50 you think so because that would be hilarious in the general senate the measure passed they didn't get two thirds of the regions to approve, which sounds like a majority still approved. Yeah. Of not allowing gay marriage. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Uh, this is keeping the probably more likely to have money uh, minority happy. Yeah. <laughs> That's where it always comes down. It's like the, the it's like the Adventist church is really not wanting to allow women to get married or to women to be ordained. The Adventist church really not wanting women to be ordained, but also not wanting to piss off the rich Adventists in California because that's where so much of the church's money comes from. So many lady bits out there that just want to get ordained. And <laughs> that's, fine. That's, the, that's the word of the day, not hoo-hahs. It's oh, okay. Bits. All right. So anyway, this sounds to me exactly like it's going to end in a schism, just like the Methodists did. They just spent way more time, energy, and money getting there than it was necessary. They're basically setting up the post-schism governments just at the, at the classes level. Uh, Jason Greathouse of Alabama, at the age of 24 in 2008, uh, was a youth pastor and was invited to live in the home of uh, a church member's family. This is not going to end well. With a 14-year-old girl. Uh, he was 10 years older than her. Yep. They had sex. Yep. She got pregnant. Ugh. They got married. Of course. They got divorced. And 12 years later, she decided to file rape charges against him. Wow. So, last year. Um, his defense was, it was consensual. The prosecution is, she was 14. There's no such thing as consensual. Statutory rape means consent isn't legally recognized. Yeah. According to the law, she could not consent to that. It just took her 12 years to realize that, I guess. Yeah. Well, at the time, I'm sure she loved him. Well, I mean, yeah, no. She... It probably took her 12 years to realize yeah. that. Yeah. So his his lawyers got a look like I love you. Oh, you're not great. Oh, you're a dick. Oh my god, you're a rapist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh his lawyers managed to get him a really sweet plea deal. He was able to plead down to a misdemeanor and 
will not spend any time in jail. He was 10 years older and he got a misdemeanor? He got it, was able wow. to plead it down to a misdemeanor. He's a pastor in Alabama. So he got away with it. Yeah. This is exactly the opposite of what should have happened. Should happen, but uh, creepy. Yeah, yeah. And in Bangladesh, during a Hindu festival in Bangladesh, which, yes, Bangladesh is a Muslim majority country, uh, but it still has a 10% Hindu minority. Okay. The partition of India was putting Muslim majority areas under Muslim majority governments and Hindu majority areas under Hindu majority governments, well, India. And yeah, there are still Hindus in Pakistan and Bangladesh, and there are still Muslims in India. And the numbers are still quite large because with... Because it's a huge population. Yeah, like India has something like 200 million Muslims, and Bangladesh has 16 million Hindus. That's not a small number. Yeah. So they were having the Durga Puja festival, which lasts 10 days, and someone put a Quran on the knee of a Hindu god statue at one of their temples. Yeah. Muslims saw that and were outraged. Okay. At this point, at least six people have died. Jesus. Including two Hindu men. That's fucked up. Um, dozens have been injured. I would have thought that was the Hindus would be pissed off. No. Uh, more than 100 have been injured. Uh, more than 300 have been arrested. Uh, it has turned into angry, angry violence. Well, of course, if you just look at it as a book sitting on a statue, it's, that is ridiculous, of course. This is obviously preying on some, um, some other turmoil that was going on. Yeah. Now, when I first... When I first read that description, my thought was, well, why would a Muslim put his holy book on a Hindu god? Yeah. And apparently, no, it was a Hindu put the Muslim holy book on one of his gods. And as an insult to Muslims, this must be like a societal thing or a cultural thing that I don't understand. It just seems weird. Yeah, it seems arbitrary. And then posted a picture online, and that went viral, and the virus spiked a fever. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like that's exactly what happened. The people were already pissed. They were uh -huh. already there was this festival going on. They wanted to squash it, and they got an excuse to do it because somebody posted a picture and said, hey, "Look what I did, herp derp," and putting a book on a statue. That's it. Sounds like something a fourteen year old do would do. <laughs> it's just. Weird. It's just weird. It just, that's what it sounds like to me. It sounds like somebody taking the Quran, t putting it down on the LDS temple, taking the picture <laughs> saying, Herp, look at me, uh, look what I did. And then all of a sudden we have all, you know, outright war over it. All right. Well, Stupid. that wraps up the news. <laughs> and feedback. We've got Rich via the website. That big gumnet. Weather control program must be the same one transmitting secret codes into my fillings, so I got me a tinfoil hat. Rich. You need to get yourself some Weird Al Yankovic, too. <laughs> Did a whole song about it called Foil. I highly suggest it. <laughs> and from Kristiner via Facebook, via Facebook podcasts. Ooh, finally. Uh, this was my fave episode so far. Well done. Clapping hands emoji, checkmark emoji. Nice. I don't know what episode that was. We're really excited. A comment though. on, but this is awesome. We're really excited for that. We just have no idea what episode you're referring to. Yeah, uh, yeah. I got an email from Facebook that there was a comment on a podcast, <laughs> and, and you can only see it apparently from a mobile app. And I refuse to have a Facebook app on my phone, so I can't see what it. The post that it's a comment on <laughs> but that's cool thanks all right well so that is confirmation that the podcast is uh i found it religion in africa oh most recent 28 all right cool i'm gonna like her comment <laughs> all right well thank you uh that was a that was a fun one uh but this is confirmation that you can listen to podcasts on facebook now that it is actually working and that our podcast is on there. We'll actually get comments. Yeah. And I get emails about those comments. If you want to leave us a message, you can use the feedback form on the website. 
shoot us an email at feedback at atheistnomads.com or use some other way of, you know, messenger pigeon or Caw. similar. Uh, if you want to support That's the not show. not what a pigeon sounds like. <laughs> nope. Messenger crow. Woo. <laughs> Woo. And uh, if you want to support the show, you can find out how at atheistnomads.com slash donate. And until next week, remember, not all those who wander are lost. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.